Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Hey, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family family Bible study hour. Good to see you today. We're going to get back into this book of Peter. Peter, who teaches probably further behind the veil, if you look, then uh, we would, it would be a toss-up between he and Paul, but certainly it's jam-packed because this epistle has a great deal of information. The subject matter has been begat to, be, to have been begotten of God anew. And that when you first learn what he has done for you and accept that, you kind of act as a new babe. But that he takes you and matures you. And the statement was that you also, when you partake of him, become a living stone. And, of course, with God being our rock, that kind of becomes symbolically our family name, if you would, then. The stones, you might say, all right? In the sense of stability, the foundation, to uh, be in control, that you are a house. Many people try to build spiritual houses. It's according to what kind of stones they use. But most of all, it's what they use for a foundation. It should be the Word of God, which is to say Christ. He is also the chief cornerstone. And without that capstone, you're in trouble, my friend. Without the foundation, you're in trouble. You can't go off out here 20 feet off the ground and begin building. It won't work that way. So, speaking of that spiritual house, let's get back to it. That that follows in chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Peter, and we ask that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua Jesus' name, precious name. Verse 6, and it reads, Wherefore, also, it is contained in the Scripture, meaning it's written there, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He that believes on that cornerstone, that elect. Uh, what does elect mean? It means he, he elected to choose that one, which is to say Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior, that is to say the Christ. And anyone that believeth on him shall not be confounded or confused. You know, there's a great deal in that. And why would simply by believing upon him, would there be no chance of you being confused? Because if you believe upon him, knowing he is the word, and it has just been reiterated that it is the word of the, that, that the word of the Lord endureth, endeavoreth, endureth rather forever, and that if you possess it, you'll never fall. Therefore, if Christ is the living word, and he is, and you absorb it, how could you be confused? Because everything will happen exactly as it's written. You can count on it. It's our Father's pro um, promise, and especially in this generation, how fortunate we are that scripture after scripture after scripture, they are fulfilled almost daily in this generation. As we see current events create a marriage with God's prophecies, and you're living in that time when these things unfold very rapidly before you. The word confounded is very important, and I'll explain why here in a moment. Verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders, underline that word in your mind, the builders disallowed, 
the same is made the head of the corner. Now to understand the seriousness of this situation, you must understand that it is the builders of this house that rejected the chief cornerstone. So who are we talking about? I would liken it into the ten virgins. Five of them were sincere and had the truth. Five didn't. You have people that are building houses today that actually in their doctrine reject the chief cornerstone because they will teach messiahs of all sorts, flyaway babies and you name it, uh, from one to the other, and you had better stick to God's word or you're going to become confused. And with that, possibly your little old flower will wilt. And there is only one way. If you listen to this man or any other man without checking him out, without following through, then how are you going to know? Because certainly, first off, the chief cornerstone, it is made very simple for us, is the Savior. It's Christ. Now, if someone rejects Christ and puts a false Christ in his place, you're going to have trouble. So just uh, to take that moment to let you know what we're talking about is builders that build with false material, false doctrines, claiming you don't even have to understand the Word of God, just believe. How, if you don't understand the Word of God and His plan, how are you going to prevent being deceived and confused? No worry about you being confused. You, didn't, you were biblically illiterate to start out, coming out the gate. How could you help being confused? You don't know anything if you're biblically illiterate. Don't let men kid you. Don't let the traditions of men make void this beautiful set of instructions that your father gave to you in building, in building your house, because you're a part of the stones, the living stones, as, it, as was reiterated in verse 5 of this same chapter. I would simply say to you, beware of the builders of church houses that reject the full, complete teaching of this word. I'll document that for you further in a moment, all right? Just hang in there. Verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. That, my friend, is the baseline. That's your prime subject. Do you stumble at the word? How could you not stumble if you don't know the word? being disobedient. You're disobedient if you don't study the Word because surely if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you want to know what Christ said. And He was with us in the very foundation and from before the foundation of this earth age when it, re, when it states uh, in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit moved upon the water. Christ was there. Whereunto also they were appointed. A stone of stumbling. What does that mean? Christ could be a stumbling block? Well, if you don't know which Christ it is you're following, there's two of them. Have you been taught? Have you been taught light, line on line, precept on precept? Or have you listened uh, to jabbering lips? It's very scriptural what I'm saying. I'm not calling people names. That's scriptural. Verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, bringing this especially a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, even a people of prophecy, if you would, the fig generation, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out, follow me, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Well, who is he talking about? Well, it's real simple. Are you still in the dark? Or do you see the light of his word? Do you see his truth? If you see his truth and you understand the situation as to the true Christ being a stumbling block, then you're not in the dark, friend. And he has called you out into the truth and the knowledge 
of his word. You know, I really didn't intend to do this. I intended to talk you through the very scripture. You see, when you are given a scripture by an apostle, such as Peter, you're supposed to turn there and pick up the whole subject, the object, what is being discussed, whereas it is written in the Old Testament, whereby you have the general idea and the in-depth meat of what he's talking about. And you're going to find it in Isaiah 26. You're not going to have it in your, on your character generator because I didn't plan to do this, but I just kind of feel at the moment here, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And we're going to go to about the 16th Isaiah 26, and I'm in 20. Five, twenty-six, twenty-eight, rather. Isaiah twenty-eight, verse sixteen. Now, I'm going to back up just a little bit from that because you want to know why this was given in the first place. Whom shall he? T I'm going to start with verse nine. Speaking of our Father, whom shall he teach knowledge? Question. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Question. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. That is to say that have matured a little bit. Those that he trusts. Those that have been nurtured. Nurtured on what? The true milk. The milk that... Peter made reference to when he said you're as a babe after the unadulterated milk. In this case, the unadulterated truth in God's word. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Now, what he's doing are some false prophets. And he's actually mocking them in this case. Verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. In other words, if you don't study my word line on line, precept on precept, I'm going to give you, this, this stammering would probably be better translate jabber, all right? With jabbering lips and a language you're not going to understand. And it's not talking about some unknown tongue. It's talking about the Assyrian, which is a type of Antichrist in the end times. Wise up. Get knowledge from God. Don't be ignorant concerning his word. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. They wouldn't listen to his word. They preferred to go with traditions of men. 13, but the word of the Lord was upon them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken, caught in the trap. You see, the thought of this, don't listen to someone that talks with jabbering lips. That knowledge and wisdom cannot be maintained. They must be weaned a little from the milk before they can get into the meat of the word. 14. Isaiah 28, 14. Wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. That means even today, if you would, my friend, because the parable of the fig tree is in effect and is blossoming and birth leaves shooting forth. 15, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Do you know who death and hell are? That's Satan, the false Christ. Instead of Jesus, have you made a covenant with him, my friend, in ignorance? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. 16. 
Here's the scripture that is written. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. In other words, he's not going to be deceived. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. That's a plumb bob. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Do you know what waters he's talking about that shall overflow? It's real simple if you stop and think just a moment. If you go to his word, you won't have any trouble understanding what water it is that overflows them. It wouldn't be like the flood of Noah. You'll read of it in Revelation chapter 12 when the water spews forth from death and hell's mouth, which is to say the false Christ, which is to say the devil, when he goes after the woman, which is to say God's bride, and chases her into the wilderness with this flood of water coming from his mouth, which, is the which are the lies that they have made a covenant with of, I've come to fly you away rather than waiting for the true Christ. The first woman taken in the field is taken by the false Christ. That is what Peter is talking about. Therefore, those that truly believe they are serving Jesus Christ, if you're not careful, he can become the stumbling stone because he expects you to get into his word line on line, but not by having some here a little, there a little, one verse Charlie, with jabbering lips, claim to be a teacher or a prophet of God's words because you will ultimately end up making a, con a covenant with the false Christ himself, which is known to you as the Antichrist. That's why it's so very serious, dear one. If you love your people, if you love your children, you better get off of the milk not listen to someone that would say to you, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. Well, I've got a question for you. Why would God write it then and say it was to his children? Are you not one of his children? Why do you listen to lies and let people deceive you? God had nothing to waste. His word and it takes the entire package for you to receive the entire healing of knowledge and of illiteracy in his word. Is that to say that you're supposed to know what a teacher must know to teach? No, I didn't say that, but you better know his plan. It flows like honey and many children can quote it and understand it, do you? We live in a precarious time, my friend. Hey, your church, your pastor, your doctrine, that has been fed you through traditions down through the years, grandpa, grandma, and God bless them, thank them for bringing the word forward. But you're gonna be judged on your own merit, not what they believed. It's what you believe, what you do. There's just one big difference. You see, the false Messiah did not come in their generation, but rest assured, if you have read the word of God, and you understand those seven seals that he gave in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, you will know you are in that generation. When these events shall come to pass, no man knows the day. You see, my concern and the reason I teach, I just wonder if you're ready. I just wonder if you know these things, if you have read his word. Has he taught, has he saw fit to bring you out of the darkness? That's how you can tell, my friend. If you know that the false Christ is coming first and that you're not going to allow your Christianity to become a stumbling block because you're not going to follow the false Christ, you're going to wait patiently for the truth, then you have come out of that darkness. Because as it is written in Romans 11, all the others have the spirit of slumber placed upon them by Almighty God, and there is no man that can shake them out of it if God does not intend. If God intends that the ignorance be still overflowing in their minds, they will never understand. 
until it is time that they should be taught. What an interesting time. Even the prophets wanted to live in your generation. Take it very serious. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality. It's life. And you're living it. Okay, let's go on to the next verse. Stay out of the dark. That's what I'm saying. Okay, and I think we're ready for verse 10 here. And verse 10 reads, Which in time past were not a people. These people that came out of the darkness and could see the truth, they were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, that's unmerited favor, but now have obtained mercy, which is to say unmerited favor. Where are God's people? Do you know? Have you studied the migrations of the ten tribes that went north that have duties written in both the old and new that they must and should perform? For you see, when you come out of the darkness, you know what people you are. And I need say no more about it. Verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Divide, if you would, the flesh from the soul when you are reading these scriptures. Because your soul is controlled by the living God if you are out of the darkness. Your flesh will still act up occasionally. It will still let you down. It will still bring you bad thoughts if you allow it. But uh, then I don't know too many times that a bad thought has been a sin. It is when the, you allow the flesh to act upon it. Be careful, my friend. Your soul is what God is very concerned with. Do you know His Word? Do you, or do you have a relatively knowledgeable um, approach to His Word? That is to say, understanding. Verse 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, there's that word works again, which they shall behold, they can see that, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now he has identified two things here. First of all, back in the beginning, he told you that this was written to those that were scattered among the strangers, all right, Gentiles. So he is talking to those tribes, and in verse 2, chapter 1, was to the elect, those that have been brought from the darkness. Therefore, if you consider those things, you can understand this verse 12 with more ease. In other words, there are many Gentiles as well as other people, as far as that's concerned, that have not the light, but are still in darkness. Let your work so be that all, if that's all they can see about you, that the works that you do document to them that you are a good, godly person. And no one, don't, don't expect perfection from yourself. People don't expect perfection from anybody. So don't, don't ever make, many times, the reason I say that is not as an excuse. But m most of you know yourselves well enough that to know that if it depended on perfection, there's no need in even you trying. No need in even starting out. You're not going to make it. But you see, once you take that first step, once you set that good life, people will allow you a little slippage. I'm talking about now those that see your works. That's a good man in our community. That person is very wise. It would do us well to listen to him. That's what they will say. Or that woman is a very wise woman. I can take advice from her and know it's sound. You see, and then that opens up. 
by your works, the deeper things of this, uh, an opportunity for the deeper things of the Spirit to come forth by the example that you have set forth in your community. Verse 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. For your sake? No, for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme. In other words, what it's saying here, obey the laws of the land for the sake of Lord, the Lord and his word, for the sake of this word. In other words, in this great nation, America, we have freedom of religion. And as long as we obey the laws of this land, this land must guarantee our right to be able to broadcast and spread the seed of God's word and protect us while we're doing it. You got it? It's very simple. No big step to it. What happens if you disobey the laws of the land for God's sake? You're throwing in jail, prison. You're not going to spread too many seeds there. Uh, though it may, perhaps could be some destiny to do just exactly, be that as it may. But you that are supposed to take his word forth, follow God's word and obey it and receive his blessings Verse 14, are unto governors, governors here would be the same title that is used in the Greek for Titus, I'm sorry, for, for um, Pontius Pilate, for Festus, so forth. As unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. In other words, as as long as you're not an evildoer and your works are good, you're going to be guaranteed the right. Remember Romans 13. There is no power in existence that God has not ordained it. It wasn't part of his plan. And, and be very careful who you listen to among traditions of people that are unlearned. Example, uh, tax is, is it's a law of our land, one of the laws that we should pay our tax then let me tell you something. The way Daniel was the number one in Babylon, I mean, he made the decisions. Uh, the old king of Babylon said, hey, he's it. He's in command. What, what was his job? He was a tax collector. You see. So don't break laws of any land you're in as long as it does not prohibit you that is to say, or force you to do something that is against your um, God-given right to serve the living God. Now, there's not too many countries that you'd even have to worry about that in. How beautiful our Father's Word. The common sense simply flows from it, giving you instructions on how you can be a faithful servant and your works be fit and respected in any nation. Verse 15, for so is the will of God. In other words, it's God's will that you do this. That with well-doing that you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men or put to silence the traditions of men. Traditions passed down and even those that would build a church and they pick up these old traditions passed down from grandma to grandpa and to great, 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 great grandpa and so on and so forth. Yeah, they did it and I know it's right. You can count on it. Well, can you really? It's more important. Sins of a grandparent don't pass on to a grandchild unless they're doing the same thing. Each person answers for themselves. The question is, are you biblically illiterate? If you are, you've got trouble, my friend. Well, you don't understand, brother. I've gone to church all my life. Oh, you have. Well, then you shouldn't be biblically illiterate. But I can certainly understand how you well could be if you've never heard anything but a one verse, Charlie. Verse 16. As free, verse 16 of this uh, second chapter, as free and not using your liberty 
for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Now, that's a very interesting, a very important verse. What freedom are we talking about? Your freedom of Christianity, your freedom in Christianity. Don't use it maliciously. In other words, God gives successful people much power. He does. A power, a, a powerful ministry, in many cases a very wealthy ministry, never misuse it. Always use it to the glory of God and do not take the freedoms and the blessings and the riches of your father and use them maliciously. All right? Hey, you're through if you do. Verse 17. Honor our esteem. Hold up all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. I, you, couldn't be, you couldn't be given better advice, my dear friend, to stay out of trouble, whereby you are free to teach God's word or to do his will. I could even oversimplify it. I, I could give you a little deeper meat for you that wanted to really go deep. And as much as we're talking about elect and Gentiles and so on and so forth, that you check out the brotherhood and take it to the prime in the Greek, and you'll find out it means of the womb, brotherhood. But further than that, it is even extended to the very community, country, king, leaders, and so forth. Love them. Honor them. But what it really means is this. Take that that you have, that is to say knowledge, wisdom, and lift up all people around you. Don't try to tear people down. One of the best ways for you to get yourself out of the will of God, and that's what's important from verse 15, so is the will of God that you do these things. And if you're not in the will of God, you just scrubbed it, my friend. You, I mean, you went clear off the chart. As far as blessings are concerned, downhill. Build people up. I hope that wherever you go, that every place you go is a better place for you having been there because of the good news, and if not the good news, even your works. That there are just a cut above the average that people can see so that the unbeliever can see a good person. If the unbeliever sees a cheat, a liar, a person with problems, then don't try to teach God's Word. All right? Don't try to be an ambassador for the Lord if you're no good. You may be a really inside, deep down, a real good person. You just don't have your act together. What I'm saying is, see that after you absorb the knowledge of God, that it improves your character, personage, to the point that wherever you go, except in rare circumstances, it's a better place for you having been there. And then people will know when a man, woman, or child of God has walked through a place. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. I don't care if they're mean, honorary, or whatever. Be good to them. Obey them. Serve them well. You see, God knows all things. And I know that many of you work for people. I mean, you write letters to me, and I know it. I know that your employer may be a little rough on you. But if you do a better job than anybody else, I don't care if he is forward, God will either get rid of him, give him a new heart, or he's going to think so much of you that he won't be fro uh, um, unjust to you anymore, that being the meaning of the word. Verse 19, for this is thankworthy. This, this makes God happy. If a man of conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. 
In other words, if you're working at a place and they're really dumping on you, if you endure that and let it roll off of your back and it does not face uh, your shell of Christianity, for Christianity farms a shell around you, let it hit it and fall on the ground. Who cares? Show them what a Christian can accomplish. 20. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, in other words, you got it coming, you messed up, you shall take it patiently. But if, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. In other words, God really takes note of that. And when he takes note of that, don't worry, you don't let people pick on your little ones. You're one of God's little ones. He's not going to let anybody pick on you too long. He'll knock them off your back if, they've, if they're riding atop your Christian shell. You know, a boss, an employer, usually the reason he has employees is to better his himself. In other words, he has employees to make him money, to give him gain. And if he has someone that is helping him sooner or later, if they're doing better or a cut above, and even though he could be a very hard man, don't worry, when you react as a Christian should, he sees that love, he feels that love, and he'll get off your back sooner or later, or as I stated, God will knock him off, don't worry. God loves his children, especially the little ones. Like he's, uh, if, if you understood the beginning of this chapter with Peter, he really takes care of the little ones. That's to say the young ones in Christ, if they can just learn that patience. Oh, what a, what a time to live, beloved. This in no way, in no way means that you have to take malarkey from, from a neighbor that persist in harming you or your family. You know, you must stand up for your rights because people will lose respect for you if you don't. What we're talking about here is those little common things that don't amount to a hill of beans that can seem to be mountains to some people. They get all nervous and upset about it. You be patient. You serve the living God. Let your works be an example that sets you apart from other people. For regardless if it's a believer or an unbeliever, they say, there is a good person. They may not even like you, but they still have to say, there is a good man or woman. All right? That's Father's advice. He'll pick up the slack from there and see that you, not they necessarily, are the ones that receive a blessing because if you do those things, you are their blessing. All right, bless your hearts. We're gonna stop there for this lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please?